Welcome back to Beards and Brews. Hey, if you haven't already, be sure to hit those subscribe and follow buttons and hit those notification sounds wherever you're listening. Not only does it help us out, but you'll know exactly when we have another one brewing. Fellas, this week's movie is going to be a good one. Seven Psychopaths. This movie is all about amazing dialogue and just some of the most like honest to goodness performances I think I've yeah. seen in a movie in a long time. Like each of these characters, even the psychopaths, in their mm-hmm. own special way seem so believable and even approachable and likable. Even the psychopaths. It's just man, this movie is so well written. And you said that like everyone put in a, like an honest to goodness performance. Man, the honesty is so much on point. Even from Chris Walken, who's like super notorious for being lazy, every line just hits, and you're just like, man, this guy's great. Yeah, by the end of it, I started thinking, like, honestly, is this Christopher Walken's best performance? He does a great job in this. Not that he isn't always great. He's Christopher Walken, but damn. I think, personally, that Christopher Walken puts in such a performance because he's so theatrical, and they gave him a character with a real story. It has an arc. He's a huge piece of it. And as, you know, someone who does a little bit of role-playing... When you have that wealth of just character depth to dig into, it's so much fun. So I could see him actually putting forth an effort just because of the fun character. Oh, yeah. So for those who don't know, this is a Martin McDonough film. He's uh, most well-known to me from being the writer and director of In Bruges, one of my favorite films. But he also did three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri, uh, a very Academy Award, yeah, whatever you want to say, like very hard film, but I have not seen it. But this is his other film, Seven Psychopaths, which I feel like is a little bit less well known than either one of those two. I get that because, like, In Bruges is really, I don't want to say it's a cult classic because it has like a really big following, but like, even I saw it late and it was pretty brilliant. But I feel that this is a better movie. Really? Like, well, I, I think I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, like, I love In Bruges and I'm absolutely happy that you put it to my attention but man there's something about seven psychopaths it just goes down way smoother it has like a built-in twist and if you've seen it you know it. but like you know what it is and the entertainment doesn't come from like getting to the destination where you see the twist it's the fact that you see it unraveling because someone's trying to pull all the strings i'm with you on that like as this movie develops and we learn more and more and more about the characters it's again it's going to be weird to say for the first time in a long time as you watch the character develop you actually care about them by the end of it you see that there was genuine care from these other two that are like hey man maybe you shouldn't drink let me drive this home once again and even whenever spoiler they're at the end of the bad guys got him a gunpoint he's like you're drinking and driving no nah, come on man <laughs> The bad guy. How can you call him a bad guy in this? Like, that is Woody Harrelson's character. Like, yeah. everybody is a bad guy, honestly. Like, everybody in this movie is a bad guy. Say, Shades of Grey. The main antagonist. <laughs> okay, he's he's an antagonist because we're focusing on, like, a couple of guys who were up to no good. Started making trouble in their neighborhood? Yeah, they I shot was, a couple of mafiosos on a bridge and people got scared. Now they're eating peyote in a desert with Christopher Walken with weird hair. Now, 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 all that we know that he has done is stole a dog, right? I mean, we'll get, we'll get into it. We'll get into it for sure. But right now, like he's just stolen a dog. That's just what all he does, right? You had mentioned like, you know, like there's a little bit of like uh, a closeness later on in the movie. Like you get to understand these characters. And one of the things that caught me off guard was that Sam Rockwell really, fucking loves his friend and like you know there's a twist later on the movie with some identity crises later on but like you immediately feel like man sam rockwell something uh something's not right there what's that behind the eyes nothing we have to talk about that yeah i mean he's sam rockwell kind of playing sam rockwell he's always kind of got this sort of like a kind of a wild card maybe wild card he's not like a joker but you know (laughs) he he does have that sort of wild card thing going about him and we we dive into that a little bit here i get honestly what i was getting vibes of uh through a lot of this with sam rockwell was choke which wasn't a very good movie but sam rockwell was in it it just like there's a lot of that same dichotomy in this Mm. if you all haven't seen it or read the book um it's all right 
I was just thinking that, you know, Eric was bringing up the emptiness behind the eyes, and you're like, yeah, when I see Sam Rockwell, I think about choke. And then I was just thinking about Sam Rockwell choking Colin Farrell, and I was like, I guess, man. (laughs) Oh, man. For a second, I thought you were going to, like, slide into another David Carradine reference. I was about to lose it. Oh. Well, you know, he does look like he's one step closer to the edge. Uh Let's just get this out of the way. Beginning of the movie, there's a scene on a bridge. There's two, like, I don't know, hit or whatever. Yeah, mafioso guys. Well, uh, they're waiting on a on a hit, and while they're waiting on a hit, they, they get snuck up on by a guy in a ski mask and get yep. hit. They get they got got themselves, yep. The thing is, like, we spoke a, a little bit about the dialogue being really good, and I feel like this scene had the opportunity to show, like, the dialogue of a movie this could have been in the wrong hands because it's so just cringe. Mm-hmm. Like, these guys are just like, hey, yo, I said a thing. Hey, yo, fuck you. I'm your best friend, but fuck you. Hey, I'm just trying to talk here. You know, that kind of crap. And yeah. it's just like alleviates it immediately by fortunately killing them. It's like, God, they- you guys suck. Yeah. yeah. I really got the vibe that they're showing you these two characters, the way they're trying to act, the way they're trying to have this bond, like they've been together forever. And then immediately after they're murdered, you get Colin Farrell and Sam Rockwell doing the exact same thing, except for it's clicking. It makes sense. They immediately feel like friends. And I think they sell that super good throughout the film, especially like when you said with the, the, the crisis he's later. It's, again, I, I'm going to keep saying it, that honest-to-goodness vibe that these two guys are friends for real. Sam Rockwell comes off as like a much creepier Ryan Reynolds in the way they talk. A much creepier Ryan <laughs> Just dark Reynolds. He's got the emo swoop, dancing down the street, snapping his fingers. Oh shit. Too sexy. Can't have it. <laughs> but I agree. Like that little scene where Sam's really trying to help him with the screenplay, trying to get this idea down about the seven psychopaths, by the way, the meta movie. It's just like, he's like, hey man, I just, you know, I totally didn't just like murder a bunch of people so I can show you this story in this newspaper, but I found this story in the newspaper about a guy who got murdered and stuff, and I had nothing to do with it. Yeah, man, did did you hear about this? It'd be terrible if you use this as, like, inspiration or something. Man, that, that'd be awful. Oh my god, Sam Rockwell. That's a goddamn amazing psychopath right there. Look at it. It's a damn good psychopath. And he's like, okay, then I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> he comes back just tired, sweaty. No reason. The underlying plot here is that these fellows, or at least two of these fellows, are stealing dogs. Why are they stealing dogs? To return them for money. They are nothing but kind and gentle people. We have uh, our introduction to one of the reveal, Seven Psychopaths, in Christopher Walken. And you don't get his whole big bit until way later, but he's a lot of fun and just anytime he's in a role where, you know, he can just kind of do whatever... It's wonderful. The whole whateverness does come off because a lot of his stuff just like, I don't want to say ad libbed as a bad thing. I just feel like he already had like some aces in his pocket and he's just hucking them at the camera. So we have Blase Christopher Walken, whose performance here actually fits perfectly. We get to learn that aside from wanting to dress like Jeff Goldblum, he has a uh, wife in the cancer ward. Oh, yeah. It took me a minute to figure out that that was his wife for whatever reason. But I mean,. It's a very progressive relationship for his time. You know, he's an older guy married to a, an older black lady who evidently has cancer. I don't know. They don't really mm-hmm. talk about it all that much. And he has an ascot. Jesus. What a time no, to be alive. It's a, no, it's a cravat. Well, at least he didn't say gorget or whatever those are called. <laughs> Fucking gorget. That's medieval armor. <laughs> I said gorget. I've never heard of that before. It's the uh, round piece that covers the breastplate and your, I guess, your solar plexus right between your so- shoulder blades. Ah, uh, the titty piece. All right. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, it's a cool little bit of depth they give Chris Walker because like, he's a very aloof character. You know, yeah. uh, violence and whatever that comes his way. He's like, ah, oh, whatever. You know, Jesus. He's got me. Ow. I, uh... <laughs> I had a good laugh at this when she's like, baby, why don't you get a job? He goes, I, I have a job. And she's like, not stealing dogs. How about you don't steal from people? Get a job working for the government. And he goes, you mean to tell me the government isn't stealing from people? And she's just like, oh, well, you got me there. <laughs> like she laughs. He laughs. He suddenly has some dogs under his arms laughing together. <laughs> Tom, the camera pans to him. There's an extra leash in his hand with another <laughs> yeah, dog attached. Dogs. 
that's where Sam Rockwell is actually disappearing to. He's just like, hang on, I'll be right back. It's just because he heard a dog bark in the distance. He's running outside to grab it. Oh, no, it's like a klepto thing, not like necessarily a psychotic whatever. Yeah, he's just got to, he's hoarding them. So through all this, we get little clip aways when we're talking to Colin Farrell's character. Little sort of ideas that he has throwing around about the seven psychopaths, right? Little stories, vignettes almost, right? Yeah, and he was working on one in particular. Like he had to think where like, Maybe his uh, psychopath needs like a little bit of like a sob story or like a soft pass. So he's like, oh, well, why don't we have like the Amish farmer? Yes. So, yeah, he's thinking he's like, he should be a Buddhist. This guy, this psychopath is good. No, not a Buddhist. Can't have anybody, you know, he's going to be too against violence to be a psychopath. How can a, how can a psychopath be nonviolent? All right. How about an Amish? Yeah, that's cool. An Amish. No, not an Amish. A Quaker. Got it. Ah, uh, yes. The oat man himself. Mm. Quaker oats. Now, I don't want to skip over it, though. We talk about this Buddhist character, and I want to say this movie does go above and beyond trying to exemplify women. Very progressive thinking. Very forward. You know, the things that would be tropes in Hollywood. Dumb females, etc. Things like that. Uh interracial relationships it really wants to put those in the spotlight as good things we have multi-racial couples in here we have homosexual rights advocate christopher walken i don't think they like to be called that i think they prefer homosexuals that, and i'll be damned if that was actually written i'll be absolutely you know, damned no uh, that's that's him that. just reading off the script you know it like he's like looking at it no. and he says oh they want me to call them you know and then he goes, oh, I can't. I think they prefer homosexuals. I think he's talking to the director and they're just recording it in. No, I, I, I don't know. I think he got tired of his like little made up movies. Like all of a sudden he's just like, these are my opinions now. I'm <laughs> dictating to myself in the future. No, dude, that, I don't think that's the preferred nomenclature. Asian American. Yes. So as he's doing this and being very progressive, we have Sam Rockwell in the background just trying to ramble off every 90s fucking, no, that's gay, don't do that. No, fuck you, homo. And he's just being beyond all that shit. And I think that's a really fun give and take. Like, I think what had happened was Sam Rockwell just watched every John Woo movie and was like, I want to do that. And everyone else is like, you know, this isn't John Woo, right? Yeah, I'm going to do it anyway. Oh, he wanted to steal a bunch of dubs for his movie, but he could only catch dogs. (laughs) Yes. Oh, my God. Headcanon. That is it now. (laughs) No wonder Uh, he's so just like disheveled all the time because he just has to put up with a bunch of dogs now. But I like (laughs) you were talking about how the movie like tries to be a little on the progressive side to like correct these these tropes that have been going on through Hollywood. It's not that until Christopher Walken actually says it. Like he's reading through the script and he's like, all you women, they're they're awful. They're just terrible. Why don't you have anyone with any fucking brains or someone that doesn't get shot or stabbed in the first five minutes? The line that he delivers as a retort is, oh, well, women have a very hard time. You know, it's, it's just to show that women, they have it hard. And Christopher Walken goes, yeah, I know, but... Uh, I'm pretty sure all the ones I've met can at least string together a sentence. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Once more, probably not written. Yeah. All right, so let's move on to a character we haven't introduced yet. Woody Harrelson. He's the character. It's just Woody Harrelson. I don't know. He's got a name, I'm sure. It's Woody Harrelson. Yeah, I just call him Scorpion Tattoo Harrelson because that's the only difference between real Woody Harrelson and this guy. Like, honestly, I thought he was a cop at first, then... Then once he got a hold of Precious, based on the novel pushed by Sapphire, I knew that I knew that <laughs> he wasn't. And then he turned and he had that neck tattoo. I was like, "Oh, this is a bad guy, isn't he?" In this scene, this woman, uh, played by I can only know her name as Precious, and he's got the gun to her, like, "Where's my dog?" And she's like, "I don't know. There's too much hair on these pigs' feet." What? What? That's a direct line from Precious. Ain't y'all seen it? I, I have not seen Precious. But yeah, oh neither. my god! Yeah, I just saw the yeah. meme. Honestly, I know this woman from American Horror Story far more than I know from from Precious. It's oh man, fucking... didn't she make somebody eat her shit? Does In she... Precious? No, no, the American Horror Story. <laughs> oh, I was like, I don't remember that. <laughs> I, I don't. Yeah, I don't remember that. I mostly remember her like sticking her own hand in like burning oil and shit like that. Damn. So yeah, he's 
Woody Harrelson's getting angry at this woman for losing his dog. Is that what happened? 100%. Yeah. She was okay. uh, tasked with being the dog walker. She turned around, and lo and behold, it was snatched up. Someone took it. And Woody Harrelson has her at gunpoint with this beautiful, elaborate 45 caliber handgun. And he's like, where's my dog? And she gets like two seconds to answer, and he's like clicking the gun to shoot her. And it just doesn't work. And I thought this was such a brilliant scene because... I don't know. It seemed overly real in the way that he handled the gun clicked. And he's like, hey, man, you need to use a different gun. He goes, I know it's because I don't oil it, but I really like this gun. Oh, yeah, it's handled blue. Yeah, I feel like that's exactly what Woody Harrelson, the actor, would say there. Like, no, nah, man, this gun's really cool. Yes. Like he had a run of the lot. The props mm-hmm. is like, no, sorry, not that one. That one doesn't work right. But it's cool. Yes. They couldn't have given that's... that one to Alec Baldwin. Oh, oh no! Oh. Talk about shots fired. Back to you, Chan Man. Oh, all right. So the next scene that I have—it's another scene with uh, Sam Rockwell and Colin Farrell just talking. They're at this party, and like Sam Rockwell, he's trying to get him to like let him help him write this script. He's having some problems. Maybe I should help you write it. Sam Rockwell's like, maybe you drink too much. Yeah. Well, you're a fucking dog kidnapper. And well, then that's when shit starts to fall apart. Yeah, one uh, one slur against the Irish, everything falls apart. Yeah, like, ugh, chaos ha- ensues. People get mad at each other. His girl, Colin Farrell's girlfriend is there, and she's just like, well, you fucking started it. And then the look on Colin Farrell's face when she says that is just like, how dare you? And I love that Sam Rockwell's character in this is no matter, even if Colin Farrell's wrong, he's like, Colin Farrell, you're a drunk. And he's like, fuck you. And then the girl comes over. She goes, Colin Farrell, you're a drunk. He's like, stop being a bitch to Colin Farrell. Well, you are a fucking drunk, aren't you? She's not Irish. I don't know why I did that accent. I mean, they're all Irish. Doesn't matter. Except for Christopher Walken. But in the words of our good friend Chains, Lance Henderson, he go- he gonna need a new bitch. He gonna need a new <laughs> bitch. Yeah, he wakes up on Sam's, uh, Sam's couch and is just like, why am I here? But a better question would be, Sam, why are you aggressively eating that toast? It reminded me of the scene in Ninja Turtles where they're eating the pork rinds. I don't know if it was like a piece of like intimidation against Colin Farrell or not. He just like gets it in his face and starts just chomping away just as loud as he can. What I've got from this scene is uh, Sam Rockwell's got like a poodle of some type. I don't. Is it a poodle? I thought it was a Shih Tzu, but okay. He says it's poodle. a dog. It's a dog, but he says poodle. None sure. of that matters. He says, Poodles always look like they've been crying. Maybe they just got dumped by their girlfriend because they have a drinking problem, too. God damn, ragging on him so fucking hard. What a friend. That's, that's, that's what, what friends so do, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, man, what a shame. By the way, you're a shit. Also, look at the uh, LA Weekly, page 163. All right, gotta go, bye. Gotta return some videotapes. Right, exactly. So what he has done, he has put out an ad in the LA Weekly calling all psychopaths. He wants these psychopaths to call Colin Farrell and tell him their stories. What, like, why are they psychopaths? What got them to this place? And so he gets a few of those, right? Or at least one. We hear one. Yeah, we get to hear one. I think this whole movie, mind you, I think the movie for what it is, is absolutely brilliant. They could do another movie of all the rejected calls. I would love to see those play out in vignettes. That's a great idea, yeah. So Woody Harrelson has figured out that the dog napping thing is all one big shenanigans. Shenanigans. <laughs> yeah. They find out that it's all a part of this big dog napping cartel, headed up, of course, by our good friend Chris Walken. And they're like, hey, grab that old man. He's up to no good. He knows where our dog is. And he's like, oh, God, don't shoot me. I have a wife and shit. Don't. No. And then they take him back to dog napping headquarters. <laughs> yeah. It's a it's a kennel. I mean, at this point, yeah. And Also known as dog napping HQ, sure. What I love about this scene is that, you know, Colin Farrell is, you know, visibly and understandably shocked about the situation but man chris walking is so cool is like yo kid whom i don't know and presumably doesn't know anything about the situation just talking him down just like listen shut the fuck up and be a man yes don't be a rat without saying don't be a rat just have faith that something good will happen and suddenly something good does happen in the form of murder 
<laughs> something good does happen. Yeah, our friend uh, in the red ski mask just pops in, shoots a couple of bad guys, and just like, okay, see you later. Still visibly shocked and now covered in blood. Colin Farrell is just like more shaken. And Chris Walker's just basically like, hey, Jesus. When they get back to uh, Sam Rockwell's apartment, Chris Walken's like, don't worry, it's not his blood. It is his puke. Would you like to go take a shower and wash the blood and puke off of you? (laughs) (laughs) But the way he delivered it was like so cold, but somehow caring. Yes. It's almost robotic. And that's what one of the biggest reveals of Sam's character is throughout this entire time. You keep going, man, something's weird about him. But he's never doing anything wrong. Everything he does seems to come from a place of love. And you do kind of start to get the inkling that these people aren't necessarily born this way, but just created through trauma. Because that's exactly what's happening to Colin Farrell. Yeah, 100%. If we haven't mentioned yet, Colin Farrell has this sort of... um, He's got this idea of like pacifism, like non-aggression. He's not a killer. He's not a fighter. He's just an alcoholic, man. Well, the same way with Chris Walken, like, he's clearly seen some shit, but he's so aloof. Like, two dudes just got murdered in his face, and he's like, hey, a Hakuna Matata, no worries. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, speaking of Hakuna Matata, what I've got today is No Worries IPA from our friends down at Belching Beaver Brewery. That is from Oceanside, California. So they say this is a West Coast-style IPA, and they are right. This is like a classic West Coast-style IPA. Really bitter, but purposely bitter, really green, hoppy, resinous, nothing fruity whatsoever. This is pure green. It's got a little bit of body, a little bit of sweetness to it, but not a whole lot at all. This is a green, pure, like San Diego, West Coast style IPA. It's not bad. It's not the best one that I've ever had. It's not the worst either. It's okay. That may have just been okay, but what was better than okay is the story we get from one of the psychopaths that answers the ad, old Tom Waits and his bunny holding self. (laughs) Tom Waits is in this movie. Like, I looked at him, I turned away, and I was like, wait, was that fucking Tom Waits? Yes, that's the Tom Waits who most famously wrote a song for the movie Robots. (laughs) There's a big black hole. In the danger zone. Yeah, I know it. <laughs> There's that, a world going on underground. Damn. Is that what he is most famous for? Oh, 100%. But this might take a little bit of that cake because when he goes into his like non sequitur of his story of being a psychopath, man, I was sucked into this story. I completely forgot about what was going on beforehand. Pretty interesting one. He and his old girl uh, go on a little little Bonnie and Clyde spree. Not really Bonnie and Clyde. They're just trying to kill. They're not trying to rob. They are okay. serial killer, serial killers. Dude, they found the Zodiac killer. They found Ted Cruz. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, They're pretty brutal, too. They are. And I think it's got this really good flair because uh, you get Tom Waits delivering this story and he seemed again as a psychopath. He's like, oh, well, I'm very timid. I'm very calm. I'm I'm over the hill. And he explains that they went on basically this fucking mass murder spree, killing serial killers in very violent ways. And it eventually took a toll on him for sure. And speaking of the Zodiac killer, that was the one that kind of tipped him over the edge because like not only did they pin him to a, a table, but they just covered him in gas and burned him alive. Yeah, like, pinned him to the table with his hand, like, with his with knives through his palms. Like, not just any knives, like, knives from Cobra knives. Knives from Cobra, yeah. Honestly, you want to know my, what my favorite thing about this scene is? It's the... when you go back and he starts telling this story. They're sitting at his apartment, uh, Colin Farrell's apartment or wherever. And Colin Farrell, realistically, he's kind of freaking out and he's just like, well... Do you want some coffee? He's like, no, tea. I'll take some tea, please. He goes back in the kitchen. Tom Waits starts telling his story. He doesn't come back with anything but a beer. It's possible he might have a drinking problem. Oh, facts. Oh, okay. I was also very brought in by this. I thought it was very, just in the way they shot it, thought-provoking. Because the Zodiac Killer, when they find him to kill him, it looks like he's given all that up. He's sitting there with these bunnies. He's just trying to be done. Like, maybe he has seen too much. And after they kill him, Tom Waits' character basically saves the rabbit from being burned and then begins to stroke the rabbit and it now picked up 
that trait from the Zodiac. And I took that maybe as that was Tom Waits seeing, yes, you've done bad things and you have to pay for it, even though I've seen that you have quit now. And that's kind of like where Tom Waits went with that bunny. He's done bad things, but now he's quit. So what happened to all the other bunnies? For whatever Hawks. reason, the Zodiac, the Zodiac Killer <laughs> has like 50 bunnies just roaming around his house. Well, if my math is correct, it's probably like 40,000 bunnies now. Yeah, they're just piling up in that Zodiac Killer's house. Tom Waits just took the one. She's had it for 40 years. Yeah. Oh, shit. It's like Wait, that. Ma- was that the same fucking bunny? Can't be the same bunny. What's the lifespan of a bunny? Oh, why should it just be like longer than you think? Maybe one of those little fuckers are tortoises. Oh, my God. This bunny lived to be 108. It's just been pooping so much pellets. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Google tells me the average lifespan of a rabbit is nine years. Well, Tom's well, been alive for about 211. Maybe he has some sort of elixir or something. Something's going on underground with that one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, in the meantime, this movie keeps cutting away to like Sam Rockwell's character and Woody Harrelson's characters separately, of course, doing more and more raucous things, really giving us a comic relief for these very serious tells that are intermingled in here. And the next thing we see is that Woody Harrelson has pieced together that Christopher Walken's wife character is in the hospital, and we get a very drawn out, very uncomfortable murder. It starts with him not knowing it is his wife, to him realizing it is his wife, and then just his immediacy to situations is unnerving because he's like, oh, yeah. you're her? You're going to tell me? Nope. Okay. Pow. Now, yeah, spoilers, like, you know, she does wind up getting killed, but I do have to hand it to her for handling this particular situation way better than how Woody Harrelson handled it in No Country for Old Men. Oh, Yes. 110 percent and that's explained later like i love this scene thinking about it like just the slow burn to like a point that it's uh, you just can't turn back from yeah. once he whips out that end bomb with the hard r we know that <laughs> something's gonna go down then she comes out with well you figure it out dumbass and then it's over Hell yeah it's over. So he drops the hard R and she's like, mm, you're going to have to shoot me, motherfucker. Starts taking out her earrings. <laughs> Dude, I just absolutely love that's 100% what she picked up from Christopher Walken, just being with him forever. Just the same attitude and bravado of just the fuck you to your face no matter what. Yeah. No, I don't care. I'm going to kill you. Okay. Eat and a then, dick. See, that's why, like, okay, so, like, there's, just, like, a little bit of a timing thing where he's basically waiting for Chris Walken, but given the conversation that Woody Harrelson had with his wife, you know, he kind of thinks he has to wait longer, might have just missed him, who knows, on his side. But Chris Walken timed it perfectly to where, like, he totally knows what just happened, and he just has, like, a moment to kind of, like, feel Woody Harrelson out. So they're just sitting in this, like, little lobby, and Woody Harrelson's like, are you looking at something? He's like, no, but if I had a soldering iron, I'd plunge it in your face. It's like, oh, yeah. man, you're going to stab me in the face? Well, I would need to clean that up with your, what is that thing around your neck called? It's a cravat. This motherfucker <laughs> takes that cravat off. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I don't think we've set this up well enough just yet. Because we haven't told the story of this Amish farmer yet. We haven't told that story. They're not going to know what this means. Well, I was going to let him know that it was from when he was in Sleepy Hollow as the Headless Horseman. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's canon. Guy knows. Stupid fucking teeth. So was Woody uh, Harrelson Ichabod Crane? Maybe. Okay, so let's talk about this story <laughs> before we get back to this waiting room, if if you all don't mind. Okay, long story short, there's this fella who killed a woman, and that particular woman's dad sent the guy to jail. Absolutely, he deserves so, but, like, he just kind of stuck around, even as he's in prison, just, like, staring at him from afar. Like, he serves this time, he gets out, but there's just always that, always that lady's dad in the background just watching, just haunting him from afar, so... One day, he's had enough. Not even an enormous amount of Jeebus could help him. And he decides to take his life with a razor blade to his neck. But the twist is, the woman's father saw him do it, and then he ends his his whole life with another razor, just because he just wanted to follow him straight to hell. Or did he? Did it, it, did it, it. Now that was Sports Center. That was Sports Center. (laughs) So, flashback to this waiting room. Got Christopher Walken sitting across from Woody Harrelson. He's like, hey... What's that around your neck? It's a cravat. You should have it. So he unties this cravat to see the scar running along his throat. And that's the reveal. Bum, bum, bum. 
Okay, yeah, it's a scar, but it looks pretty fresh, to be honest. I was like, did he just get that fixed? I had it touched up for this scene. <laughs> yeah, it started out with super glue, and then I used some Elmas. <laughs> then we hit it with a makeup shade. It's called Walking Gray. Uh, meanwhile, we get a comic break, and uh, it's Sam Rockwell. Turns out he's banging Woody Harrelson's girlfriend while Woody's too yeah. busy out running around worrying about his dog. And I love this scene because he gets the phone call from Christopher Walken going, Hey, uh, your <laughs> friend killed my, my my wife. And he's like, Oh, man, you sound shook up. Give me five minutes. <laughs> Eat some cheesy poofs, all quick. And then shoots his fucking girlfriend in the tummy. He's like, Wow, never say I did something for you. And there's a moment where you go, oh, he's keeping her alive for whatever reason. Gut shot. But in reality, he's not. He shot this woman in the stomach and she bleeds out, which is one of the most painful ways to go. For sure, for sure. And like the movie kind of reveals that they, oh, he was the first psychopath all along, as if we didn't already know. Winky face. Yeah, she. he leaves like a the Jack of Diamonds, which is the same card that was left at our, our original, the guys up in the on the bridge. And it says, like, it's been introducing all of these psychopaths, numbers one through seven. It says, psychopath number seven. Number one. Sorry. <laughs> I, like, I, I kind of wanted the movie to step out even further, like, even to actual reality. And Call of Duty was just like, what do you mean? That wouldn't that mean it's six psychopaths altogether? And they just sack him. Yeah, it's just immediately. Next, we have a car scene where... Woody Harrelson is going to get them. He's going to kill them. So they run off into the desert. And whenever Woody gets there, he loses his shit. Not because his girlfriend was just killed, but because now he doesn't know where the fuck his dog is. I mean, he loves that dog so absolutely much. Like, it's almost more than John Wick or something like that. Because in that brief scene that we mentioned where his girlfriend got shot in the belly, of all the things that could have been in like his picture frames, it was just him and his dog super zoomed in. But yeah, they're on their way to Sam Rockwell's apartment, just white knuckling it on on their way there with his, I guess, number one sidekick, whatever, who happens to be the Canadian from In Bruges. That's all I know him as. I'm sure he has a real name. It's the Canadian. Uh, just another In Bruges alumni. That's okay. Yeah. There's a few of them in here. Could have used a uh, little Brendan Gleeson somewhere along the way. Miss him. Oh, could you imagine, like, the opposite? Like, Chris Walken being in in Bruges, and he's just that guy that has to spill himself over the tower. Oh. What are you or doing? You... I don't care. <laughs> it's the ground. No. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't you dying? Uh... <laughs> the director's just yelling at him, you're dead. No, I'm not. I know you. <laughs> it's just the flesh wound. Sir, your spine is coming out through your chest. Don't. Tell me what my bodies are doing. You don't get to decide that. That's choice between me and God. Don't worry. I've got a prescription. For peyote. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, for sure. Now bring me the little person. Hey, get the midget. He wants to be called a little person. He's got to stand up for their rights. Uh, Now, they've run away into the desert, and we get this, I guess drive there where they're literally discussing all the plot points in a very tasteful way to us all the way up to this point there's the reveal that uh christopher walken's the quaker we get the reveal that sam rockwell is the red mask fellow and that colin farrell's just like oh my god i'm writing this fucking movie ah and it really is neat though because they get out to the desert they're all super fucked up and man, oh man, if Sam Rockwell doesn't put out a fucking 10 on 10 performance in just describing the perfect 80s action movie ending. Yes. Okay, so this is probably unbeknownst to the audience, but we as a collective used to work together. And what I loved about this scene, it just reminded me when we all got the bullshit at the same time. And we would just like have all these fantastic hypotheticals and all these bullshit movie stories that are way better than anything coming out of Hollywood. Yes. Yeah, we might not all have been on the same page, but like, you know, there's one guy that's going to come out of nowhere with something ridiculous and we're just like, yeah, all right. No, that's that doesn't really fit Sam Rockwell. Let's let's take it a different direction. I really love that he's saying this is how the movie should end. They're like, no, but that's not how our movie would end. He goes, fuck you. I don't care. It's ending with a goddamn shootout. And it's fucking so neat that they could take this meta wise and make it unfold before our eyes, and you 
don't hate them, and it's also semi-believable. It's still not the Hollywood shootout, but it's still a shootout. It's totally because of the performances. Like, there's something creatively blasé about everybody's attitude to this particular situation. Like, like, man, this is a serious situation. People are being killed. But just there's something about, like, I guess Chris Walken just emanated himself into the film itself. And he's just like, I don't care. And you're just like, yeah, man, you're right. Well, I shouldn't care. You've got two psychopaths, like self-determined psychopaths, I guess. And then Colin Farrell, he's just a screenwriter, at this, a, a, like an attempted screenwriter. Mm-hmm. He's the only one who's, like, really out of his element, and he's not really emoting that much. He is using all of this alcohol to just dull all of that, like, oh my god, what in the fuck is going on with my life right now? Uh, I guess we're going into the desert. Yeah. And he's trying to write this movie, and it's Seven Psychopaths. That's the name of the movie. That's the name of the, the movie that he's writing in the movie. And I love the fact that he goes... Well, I don't think your shootout's going to work because ABC, Hollywood Tropes, and these psychopaths are going to be pacifists and this, that, and the other. And he goes, fuck you. Then why is it seven psychopaths? Is there not going to be a fucking dual Uzi shootout, okay? If it's not going to be seven psychopaths, how about we name it the seven lesbians who's overcome all kind of shit and two of them are black? And I was fucking dying. <laughs> no shootouts. No shootouts. That's stupid. What are we making? A French movie? Oh, dude, like, the whole thing was such... It's, it's almost like the, this part of the movie was a satire on itself. His the, the fact that he explained the whole last gunfight, basically like we described earlier, as, just, as a big John Woo super shootout is just telling. Yeah. Life-affirming, schmife-affirming, it's about seven fucking psychopaths. His words, not mine. Fucking Chris Walken burst out of a coffin like Dracula. Yes. Like, <laughs> I mean, it had me laughing. Pretty He's hard. Like, Your girlfriend comes in and she is moaned down. I fucking mean moan down. And then it just cuts to her being like, duh, 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 getting shot the fuck. Yeah. <laughs> shot the fuck. He's like, the best line, I think, that he pops out, and he's like, and you realize that you gotta save your friends, and you say, fuck art, pieces for queers, and you grab out the crossbow shotgun, and Colin Farrell's face is the just so The guy fucking... is in a tree. Yes. Yeah, he's just there with his flamethrower. And and you're there, too, Colin Farrell. You're there. You're just there to observe, though. It's okay. You're not a pussy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then he was uh, the part where he's overcome with manliness and kicks over the gravestone. <laughs> Yes, like, it's all of fucking this sounds, good. All of this sounds so ridiculous, because it is, but this is legitimately just gold. Honestly, I love all of this. It kind of makes you wonder, like, was this idea for an in-shootout kind of pulled away for that Nick Cage movie we did a couple weeks ago? I yeah. thought this was just a great way to keep a serious movie, semi-serious movie, still retain that edge, but sneak in the 80s action scene that everybody wanted. You know, now that I think about it, we'll, we'll talk about the shootout and everything. This is kind of like if Tarantino was like an independent filmmaker. Not enough feet. I was going to say, <laughs> I was I was trying to find a way to get the feet in there. And all I, I was I was trying to find something with walking, you know? <laughs> something about walking feet. But then it's, it's, there's a joke in there somewhere. Well, speaking of walking, walking away, that's kind of what happens. Yeah, they find out that fucking Sam Rockwell was a killer all along. And they're like... I know I'm high as shit, but you can't be <laughs> killing people. It's not okay. And you also pretended to be my wife. <laughs> Dude, that was such an absurdly specific moment, if that makes sense. I like, don't even know if he was telling the truth at that point. Like, what did he try and voice his dead wife? I don't know, but... What? <laughs> I felt the rage in the blood of Chris Walken. Like, he was legitimately pissed off about it. Because he was right. like... Yay, yo, what'd she say? What specifically did you say? Gray and shit. The whole time, you're right, you can just see Christopher Walken's, like, blood pressure slowly rise to the point where you think he's gonna break his, like, non-aggression pact with the world, and he just, you think he's gonna choke Sam Rockwell, but he just, like, grabs him by the face and then lets go. There was, man, there's something special in that moment. I don't know what it is. I don't know how to explain it. But, like, that that look he had on his face and when he just grabs his head, but, like, restrains something and leaves. And Sam Rockwell's a little broken afterwards. I don't know. There's something in there that I can't put into words. I love that bit. 
but for the wrong reason. Like, I know I'm with Chandler. I didn't know if he actually said it or not, so I was kind of confused during the scene. And then I got super distracted because whenever he grabbed his head and was like, ah, all I could see was that Walking Dead t-shirt I have, his face on it as a zombie. <laughs> I thought he was going to bite him. So the way they found out that Sam Rockwell is actually this Jack of Diamonds serial killer guy, they're out at the, the like convenience store or whatever that happens to be at Joshua Tree. They see a newspaper there and they're like, holy shit, homeboy's a serial killer. So they go back and, you know, they they confront him about it. Uh, Colin Farrell confronts him. And he's like, yeah, I told you about that at the party. I was, I'm doing this, you know, so you can get some inspiration for your screenplay. And he's just like, you, t- you told me at the party? Damn, maybe I am an alcoholic. Okay, I didn't tell you at the party, but, you know, I have been, I, I've been, I just wanted to confront you about your alcoholism. It's worked. <laughs> yes, an intervention through murder. And then he fucking punches him. Just fucking decks him and Christopher Walken's like, hey, whoa, maybe you should cut back on the drinking if this is how you're going to treat your friends. <laughs> it's really, it's really good. <laughs> it's just this whole thing, like, they're clearly just three completely different people. But, like, they, they're in this, like, little brotherly thing at the moment, and they just have to kind of work it out because the end of the road is just, like, right around the corner. Yeah, it is. And it's so hard to honestly talk about this movie just because most of it is just character interaction. And we can't give it that justice of watching these two to three men or four, including Woody Harrelson, just interact with one another. It's it's wonderful to see on screen. Oh, you're absolutely right. So much of what makes this movie great is dialogue. Yeah. And like we are not Christopher Walken as much as we try. We're not <laughs> Sam Rockwell. We're not Colin Farrell. These guys okay. knock it out of the park. <laughs> These guys knock it out of the park so much more than than what we can try to achieve by imitating them. Yeah, well, I mean, well, absolutely cuz my Sam Rockwell impression is just this. <clears throat> Hi, I was in Moon. Oh, you go to Moon? I just go to Zaphoid Beeblebrox from uh, Hitchhiker's Guide. Man, we, we've talked about Sam Rockwell kind of a lot lately. Turns out he's kind of a great actor. Who knew? I did. Yeah, I agree. I think we all knew. No surprises <laughs> here, fellas. What else are you hiding from me? <laughs> oh, shit. Well, you know who's not hiding? Chris Walken. In fact, Chris Walken is walking a great deal. He's on his peyote trip because he can't deal with these people. And in the meantime, our good friend Sam Rockwell, afraid that Colin Farrell is going to abandon him, lights the car on fire and calls Woody Harrelson to be like, yo, 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 banana phone. (laughs) Yo, 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 banana phone. No, like in the middle of all this, you're right. Sam Rockwell's calling from the tent and it's just like, hey, we're right here. Joshua Tree, I'll give you the, the directions. Just look for the car that's on fire. Basically just like. I know you think I'm crazy, but what's really crazy is that Woody Harrelson knows exactly where we are. Yeah. Come get your dog, because he's out here in the desert, and we didn't bring water. Yeah, it's real rough out here. Or dog food. There's not even any treats. This leads <laughs> to him saying, come alone, don't bring any weapons. And I think this is such a cool thing. They're waiting for this big showdown. And Sam Rockwell's all pissed. He's like, what the fuck? Here he comes. And he's alone. Hey, where's your gun? I didn't bring one. Turn around. Let me see. And as soon as he turns around, he shoots this man. Yeah, and Woody Harrelson is as surprised as we are as an audience. He's like, shot me, man. What the hell? I didn't have no gun. You said not bring any. I said not to bring any guns, so I didn't bring one. I think, I think I'm going to die. Can I just, like, give... Give my dog a couple of little kisses. Yeah, some scratches. <laughs> some scratches, yeah. He's like, Can I just so get a couple sad. And Sam Rock was like, no, you can't have some fucking scratches. He's throwing a trail mix on the man. It's so sad. Him just like laying there on the ground. I just want to give my doggy a couple of little kisses before I go. At least let me pet my dog one last time. I'm dying. And he goes, well, then stop going on about it. And stomps on his wound. <laughs> well, this oh. is the part where like Carl and Farrell gets, you know, grows a pair. He's like, I'm. I'm going to do fucking something about it. And he takes off with uh, Woody Harrelson without thinking, that, like, hey, you know, maybe he didn't arrive alone. Well, like, uh, we got Christopher Walken, who, like we said, he's on his walkabout, but he eventually ends up down at, like, that convenience store or whatever, the little rest area. And he runs into, like, the Canadian and is just like, hey, what are you doing? The uh, the surprise on the face is totally worth it because they're just like, wait, you're supposed to... 
you're over there? Okay, whatever. Just put your hands up. No. The puzzlement is exciting. I'm just going to put that out there. I just absolutely <laughs> loved everybody just being like, what? that's usually not what happens when I pull guns on old people. No, yes. What, wh- why not? I don't want to, but I have a gun, so I don't, I don't care. care. <laughs> yeah, I don't care. Shoot me, bitch. Yes, it was just like, bitch. And the cops are there, and he's just like, look, you're going to do something. And then there's a flare gun that Sam Rockwell got a hold of out of the villain Woody Harrelson's car. He fires into the air, which was a signal for the baddies to come to them. And he's like, oh, no, how do I you know, buy my friends a little bit of time? And he pulls a Gran Torino and reaches into his shirt to pull out his finger gun. You think that's what it was? Or did he like actually have something to give him, like a little Bible or something? No, because in meta, he's pulling out his uh, little recorder thing that's voice activated so he could tell oh. him how the Buddhist story ends. Okay. No, that's there's actually a, really brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Just before this, just before this, there's a line that I don't want to skip over too much from Christopher Walken. Maybe my favorite line from the whole movie, which is saying something. They're talking, and they at this point, they know Woody Harrelson and his crew are coming. Christopher Walken says, I ain't gonna fight, but I ain't gonna run. Well, so what are you gonna do? I guess I'm gonna die. If we're talking about favorite lines, mine is also right around this area, where he's he's talking to Colin Farrell because there's been the betrayal, and he's like, aha, I've got a gun now because my bad guys are here. And he goes, ugh. Oh, Oh, no, don't shoot me. And he goes, I bet you wish you had a gun now, don't you, fucking Colin Farrell? He goes, no, I don't believe in him. He goes, what the fuck do you mean you don't believe in him? They're not leprechauns. They're not fucking leprechauns. <laughs> Got him. Yeah, I wrote that one down, too. I fuck, my favorite line is when way earlier they were just talking about the, whether or not they should go to the cops, you know, to sort this whole dog situation out. And without a, missing a beat, Chris Walker's like, fuck the cops. Fuck them. Fuck them. Fuck those cops. Ah, so good. Uh. So much good dialogue here. Christopher Walken gets shot. There's this amazing speech from Woody Harrelson about why is Colin Farrell being such a baby? He only lost two friends. He's lost four plus a girlfriend. He's just yelling at him and smacks him in the head with a gun like to be like, stop being a baby. Yeah, that's what I was talking about earlier. He's like, what are you doing? You've only I'm trying to do like an Irish accent. Never mind. He's like, what What are you so crying about? You've lost two friends. I've lost four plus a girlfriend that I honestly didn't like very much but that makes five you've only lost two but then he's just like yeah the math checks out but you know i'm a drunkard wait are you drinking and driving (laughs) he was concerned he looked around like please is there a designated driver in the desert really he's like no i'm just i'm just writing a movie he's like are you gonna cry over your your dog and he's like (laughs) all that's left is the final shootout quote unquote final shootout yeah they all show up, and uh, he's like, throw out your guns. He throws out two. He's like, I know you had a third. He throws that bitch out, too. But he comes out with the dog and a flare gun, and I thought that was awesome. Even Sam Rockwell was just like, totally forgot about this fucking uh, flare gun. Guess I gotta use it now. Like, yes. when the flare gun was even originally discovered, like, R- Sam Rockwell's, like, looking through his car. is like, hey, I told you you didn't come unarmed. Like, That's a flare gun. He's just like, you're yeah, a flare you gun. Can, you can do a lot of damage with a flare gun. I cannot imagine that scene and not have Charlie Kelly reading that line for some reason. Like, I don't know what it is. I need Charlie Kelly to play this role. (laughs) Like, Sam Rockwell does a great job. Amazing job, even. Perfect. I just want to see Charlie Kelly in this role. I think he would be too comical in it. I think Sam Rockwell does a good job of oddly serious. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you're saying, like, Sam Rockwell would have been the perfect choice for a cable guy? Yeah, I think that oh, would have been man. a really fucking dark movie. Oh, man. I think you just did something here. I did. Ben Stiller hit me up. Oh, shit. Get at us. Remake time. So he's like, I'm going to burn your dog. Get out of here, Colin Farrell. He's like, I'll never forget you. I love you, Billy. He's like, love you, too. <laughs> love I'm going to make it. <laughs> and... <laughs> Fucking out of nowhere, he tries to shoot him. Click. You hear the gun click. And again, he didn't oil the gun. So he's like, I'm going to count to five and you better kill me. And he's like, okay. And he gets to two and he's like, can you start back at five? And he's almost crying because he still hasn't Dude, fixed his gun. It's such a bro moment because he's like, no, I'm not going to restart the counter at five. And it just cuts to like Woody Harrelson just kind of like not weeping, but like, you know, worrisome. Just trying to like fiddle with his gun. He's like, uh, five, four. He just starts it again anyways. 
and this culminates in death. It's a very like again uh, immediate scene. He's just like mm-hmm. five, four, boom, and he's fucking done. And it goes out in this real weird note of, of course, bad guys getting arrested. But Sam Rockwell with a fucking bullet in his brain, a forty-five caliber round, mind you, and he's just like, "Give me paw, puppy," and it does. And so. I guess there's this, the dog loves him and not Woody Harrelson, so Woody Harrelson's getting punished somehow. But we get the wrap-up, which is Christopher Walken's recording. And it's literally, I don't want to talk about it too much, because I think it's worth watching the movie to get that reveal. Okay, yeah, I see that. Okay, okay, we'll keep it in the dark for those who still want to watch the movie and not our, uh, you know, investigative journalism. But I do have to mention that it is about fixing Colin Farrell's screenplay, like, you know, fixing his movie, like, all the holes and stuff. Yeah. And and it's actually really good, and it seems very, very genuine. Like, you know, this is actually Chris Walken trying to help out. But then, you know, once that shit's over with, he just starts to go on this tirade about how, like, you know, labels have changed for the gays. I don't think they're being called that word. They want to be called homosexuals. <laughs> yeah. the, there's credits that start rolling, and then they're like, wait, we got we got some other stuff. Old Zachariah, Tom Waits, calls him <laughs> up and is like, hey, I watched your movie, but, you know, you promised to put a little thing at the end for me and you didn't do that. Well, now I'm going to kill you on Tuesday. Is Tuesday good for you? Yeah, I'm going to kill you on Tuesday. You sound like you're, you've are you been through some hard stuff. You, you all right, man? All right, Tuesday doesn't work. We'll reschedule. I mean, you know, he basically just turned into a shrink for whatever reason. It was a really weird transition in the conversation because Colin Farrell answers the phone normally. He's like, hello, what's going on? And then he's like, I'm going to kill you. And he goes, oh, no, I've tuned out. I'm very here now. And he goes, well, I guess since you're there now, I'm not going to kill you. You're kind of scary to me. Let me grab my bunny and run away. I was like, I I guess I could have done without that. I think it's like a little bit of a passing of the torch. Like he was around these psychopaths and through this trauma, he kind of became one. Yeah, like, I just like how he's, we've got Tom Waits at the very end in a phone booth of all things, because those are still around, with a bunny and a machete. The duality of man indeed. Yeah, it just makes you (laughs) want to pick up a sweet copy of Robots and watch it. (laughs) Uh, I thought this is a genuinely fun, thoughtful film that has a fresh approach on friends and filmmaking. All I can say is bravo. I'm right there with you. This movie was just such a treat. It's just sharp enough. It's just slick enough. It's just very well made, written all around a good time. Absolutely recommended. So I'm already a big fan of In Bruges, Martin McDonough's other major film. Uh, Maybe I should watch the three billboards movie. But yeah, it turns out Martin McDonough is just great at screenwriting. This is incredible all the way through. Love the dialogue. Love the acting. I love everything about this movie. It's been recommended to me so many times. I hate that it's taken me so long to watch this. 10 out of 10. Can't recommend enough. Well, there you have it. That was Seven Psychopaths. If you have any strong feelings about the movie or the show, leave it in that comment section below. Be sure to hit all the buttons, the like, the subscribe, the upvote, the downvote, the all of them. Make sure you hit the bell icon so you don't miss what we've got brewing up next. Then follow us on social media. We got Instagram, a Facebook, Reddit, Twitter. You can find us anywhere. Podcasts are available. You know, YouTube, we're here. Give <laughs> us a listen. If you don't, we'll be over on Tuesday. I mean, Tuesday's pretty good. Tuesday's good? No, I can't make it on Tuesday. I got something. Uh, you good on Thursday? Ah, I got a bat mitzvah. Sorry. Oh, I can't do it on bat mitzvah. The, you got to wait uh, two weeks before you're buried in Jewish something or other. I don't know. You got to wait for it to be kosher. <laughs> <laughs> and I love my meat and cheese together. Anyway, so... Yeah, it's the end. <laughs>